Relatively early on in the Ukraine-Russia war, I did a basic comparison of the military budgets, industries and economies of the Western and NATO powers as compared to Russia. I also warned at the time that it's a heck of a lot more complicated than the relatively simple analysis we did at the time. I hinted that while it's satisfying and comforting, you can't really just take the Russian GDP or the Russian equipment purchase figures, put them next to the American and NATO figures, and have that be the complete end of the story. Today I want to take a closer look at exactly what I meant. Because you'd be forgiven for thinking that military budgets and expenditures are relatively simple things. You go look up CIPRI or some other major source, and it's pretty clear, it's night and day clear, how much money different nations spend on their defence budgets. I put some of those CIPRI figures there, for example, you can see that nice big bubble on the left is the United States, $778 billion in 2020, China on the far right with 252, and the smaller numbers orbiting around them. So when you ask someone how much a country spends on defence, they might think there's a relatively simple answer. But assuming that you don't value the friendship particularly much and you want to make them squirm a little, then ask the question. Okay, that's how much they spend. How much does it cost? And as soon as the question turns to any particular system, ask the follow-up question, where was it built? Because there's a lot more that goes into calculating the cost and benefit of a nation's military spending than just a headline figure in US dollars. And while there's a lot that goes into that, I'm going to start trying to unpack one small part of it today. Okay, so what am I going to be covering? First, I'm going to give a brief introduction to defense budgets and common issues with comparing them. So basically, what are some of the main causes of error? I'm going to gloss over the ones that I'm not going to dig into deep on this episode. Then I'm going to jump to the stuff I really want to focus on, which is manufacturing and procurement. The make or buy decision. I'm going to look at some of the barriers to nations bringing production onshore, which is where naturally you'd assume most nations would want it. And then I'm going to close out with a case study by looking at some of the comparative advantages that the US and the US military industrial complex enjoys, particularly in aviation, because I really think that brings home some of the concepts I want to talk about when we're dealing with things like comparative advantage and real economic costs. But first, I just want to be very clear, there are two things that I will not be trying to do because I am on the clock here. The first is this is not going to be a detailed opportunity cost economic evaluation. I'm not arguing that you should build fighter jets over bridges and what the relative economic benefit of those things are. What I'm doing is I'm comparing different sorts of military spending across countries and describing how the real costs and economic impact can be different. The other thing is I'm not going to talk really about China or Russia. Both of them complicate the analysis. Both deserve their own videos. Before we jump in, I just wanted to welcome back returning sponsor, Ground News. If you follow major international events, you'll know that accurate, unbiased news is hard to find, and that it's ever more important to break out of the echo chambers of particular coverage. Ground News is a news comparison platform that helps you do just that. It's a combination of an app and a website that allows you to instantly compare coverage for particular topics across different news outlets from around the world. This is a story from earlier this week about the leaders of the so-called DPR and LPR planning to block the Google search engine. At a glance, you can see that Ground News tracks 17 sources covering this particular topic. Ground News lets you instantly switch between headline coverage, see which organisations are emphasising what, and catch any hidden details. It lets you build a picture out of the entire media ecosystem, not just one story. And it can also let you identify broader patterns in coverage. Not every story is going to get the same amount of coverage everywhere on the political spectrum. And what Ground News allows you to do for every single one of the stories that they feature is to zoom in and identify potential blind spots in coverage. It's a great way to get an understanding of what's being reported on the other side of the political aisle. It also brings together a whole bunch of contextual information, whether that be the details of media ownership for particular companies, or Ground News evaluation of their historical biases or factuality ratings things that can provide just a little more context to coverage. There are no silver bullets in the fight for accurate information, but I think we have to try. And Ground News may be a tool that helps you see things just a little bit differently. If you're interested, there's a link to check out in the description, ground.news slash Perun. So to jump right in, what's in a defense budget? What is in that headline 750 billion figure? Well, obviously, there's an awful lot in there. They tend to be very, very long documents, but there's usually a couple of main categories we use or we look at when we're comparing budgets across countries. There's personnel expenses, so that's paying for your people. There's procurement of equipment, which is buying stuff and things that go bang. There's basing and infrastructure, which is where you put your stuff and you put your people. And then sometimes you'll see dedicated other categories. And if you spend much time online and you search defense spending or military budgets, usually you'll just come up with a nice, simple table like this. 
And the story behind it is equally pretty simple. The United States is the big spender, way outspending everyone else. China is in second. And then Russia is hanging around the same level as Germany and Saudi Arabia. And everyone is left wondering, why is Russia so threatening if they're hanging around at that level? Is Saudi Arabia about to try and conquer Ukraine? Or if not that, why haven't they at least rolled up the whole Middle East by now? Now, obviously, straight out the gate, there are some issues with these figures. For one thing, a dollar goes a heck of a lot further in China or in India than it does in the United States. You don't have to pay your soldiers as much. Manufacturers are willing to provide stuff cheaper because labor is lower. So when you make purchasing power parity adjustments, all of a sudden those Chinese, Indian and Russian expenditures jump way up, while those in the UK and Germany kind of stay at least mostly where they are. And that's just a multiplier over the headline figure. You then need to ask, well, what's included in the official budget and what isn't? Because there's no UN resolution on what does and doesn't get counted in a defence budget. If you look at people costs, personnel expenditures, for example, this is a major driver of cost for most militaries, but there's a lot of room to manoeuvre in what you do and do not include. So, for example, veterans' entitlements. A lot of countries give veterans access to things like free healthcare, education entitlements, housing concessions, and all these things may or may not be included in a nation's defence budget. Some nations will include pensions, some won't and this can have a distortionary effect on their headline figures. This is also why a lot of research institutes will make adjustments in order to try and get like with like comparisons. Then there's even dodgier and difficult questions, things like conscription, because conscription is ostensibly very, very cheap. When Russia pays its conscripts its $30 monthly stipends, it's not really hurting the budget bottom line that much. But it's probably hurting the government and the economy in other ways. For one thing, that conscript might be doing other work instead of spending a year or 18 months in uniform. During that time, they'd be generating economic activity. They'd be paying taxes. So the cost is a lot more than $30 a month plus room and board. This is a topic that really merits its own video, but not a video for today. Instead, I want to talk about procurement costs, the cost of buying stuff. And here, some of the biggest problems are actually at the individual system level rather than the overall budget bottom line. If you spend too much time on Wikipedia or on Quora or on the internet, you'll find a lot of sources all over the place trying to explain to you how much your favourite aircraft or tank actually costs. And a lot of those estimates are junk. Because all too often, what someone will do is they'll take a contract for the sale of a plane or a tank to a certain country, they'll divide the value of the contract by the number of things they sell, and they'll say, ha, huh, therefore the system costs x million dollars or x billion dollars. In reality, that's not how most military contracts are published. The system price, if you're selling an aircraft or a tank, might easily vary up to three times depending on what sort of support services are you selling with it. Are you just selling them the plane? Are you selling them the plane with ordnance? Are you selling them the plane with training services, with spare parts and technical support services for the next 15 years of their service life? Well, obviously, that's going to have a major impact on the price, isn't it? I put up there an extract, and it's not the entire extract, of the information regarding a foreign military sale to Saudi Arabia, which was listed as, in some headlines, a $30 billion sale of 84 F-15s to Saudi Arabia, which makes them incredibly expensive F-15s. But when you look at the sale, it also includes 170 radar sets, 100 Vulcan cannons, 193 engines, thousands of bombs and guided munitions, hundreds of thousands of cartridges. If you keep reading, it also includes upgrade packages for existing aircraft, training services, technical support, etc, etc. So this is just a public service announcement. The next time you see a listed unit cost of the system, make sure you check the methodology on how that cost has been calculated before you go making comparisons. But at the overall total budget level, this is less of a problem. Militaries tend to disclose how much they spend on their major systems and procurements. So, so far, so good. But even more than the question of how much the stuff you're buying costs, the real kicker that I wanted to talk about today is where you buy that stuff in the first place. Because financially, economically, there's a world of difference between purchasing a fully made system overseas and trying to actually construct it in your home territory. After all, there are reasons beyond simple national prestige that explain why nations pour so much money into trying to prop up and support their own domestic industries. When you buy something abroad, the cost calculus is pretty simple. But when you're constructing it at home, well, things get a little complicated. I mean, let's illustrate with a simple example. Let's go back to that Saudi Arabian example from before. 29.43 billion US dollars for the purchase of 84 new planes, 70 upgraded aircraft, and a whole bunch of munitions, support services, etc. Financially, this is as simple as they come. 
Saudi Arabia hands over 29.43 billion US dollars, which passes into the pockets of the US firms and the US Defense Department, the various suppliers essentially, but all on the American side. And in exchange, Saudi Arabia gets, well, a huge amount of stuff. The total cost for the Saudi government is pretty simple. It's 29.43 billion US dollars in financial terms. That's wealth that's being removed from the Saudi national wealth in total, and it's being replaced with a whole bunch of F-15 SAs. It's the kind of budgeting and accounting that we're used to in our ordinary lives. Every time we buy something, the money goes away and we get goods or services in exchange. But when Uncle Sam spends about the same amount of money to buy a bunch of F-35s from Lockheed Martin, well, things are a little bit different because governments aren't really like people. Governments have a superpower that individuals don't share. Namely, unlike us, governments have the ability to do things like levy taxes on companies that operate in their nations. So to illustrate how this might work in the context of a procurement, I've got an extract from Lockheed Martin's 2021 annual report there, which shows things like their earnings, their cost of goods and services sold, their earnings before taxes, the amount of taxes they paid, etc. So let's use this to illustrate the point. Uncle Sam spends $30 billion on F-35. Lockheed Martin presumably makes some profit off that. Let's just say it's $4 billion. I'm using a ratio derived from the annual report to get that. Well, instantly, they're going to pay tax on that profit. They're going to get deductions for things like R&D tax credits and things like that, but they are going to pay about 15% tax right back to the government. So Uncle Sam gets $600 million back right off the top. Then Uncle Sam starts looking at the cost side of the equation. Lockheed Martin spends $26 billion making the fighters before it hands them over. Well, a lot of that goes into salaries. Salaries means income taxes for the employees. It means payroll taxes for the company and the employees. So Uncle Sam takes a share again. The bit that isn't salaries is usually purchases from contractors around the world that contribute to the F-35 program, many of which are in the United States. And they presumably make profit, which they pay tax on. And a lot of their costs are employees who pay taxes. And their costs in turn are subcontractors who make profit, who pay taxes. You can see how the cycle goes on and on. At every stage, at every transaction, government extracts a little bit of value back to the government through taxation. Now, sometimes money is going to leak out of the system. A contractor might be foreign, in which case the money passes out beyond Uncle Sam's taxation remit, or it might pass into the hands of value in the hands of a shareholder, and the government doesn't really get its hands on that until later when the individual sells their shares and maybe pays capital gains. But you get the point. And government isn't just interested in the cash that it gets back. The money that's investing in the F-35 or other procurements that it's doing with its domestic manufacturers, well, that supports the domestic industry and workforce, which is something that government considers to be in its interest. I've got some figures there, which are admittedly from the Aerospace Industry Association's report, so keep that in mind. But the defense and aerospace sector in the United States, as calculated by them, employs about 2 million workers. There's about $874 billion in industry revenue there. A lot of exports, about $90 billion. And importantly for a government looking at this situation, there's a lot of very high-paying jobs there. Government cares deeply about keeping unemployment low for obvious reasons, but it's not just about having enough jobs to go around. One thing that there's a dearth of shortage of in many economies is a good supply of high-paying jobs. There's plenty of gig economy jobs, but getting jobs that pay more than $100,000 per year, well, that's complicated. And the defense and aerospace sector is one of the areas of the US economy that still can relatively consistently deliver that. By comparison, it's probably kind of hard to make 100 k a year driving Uber. Without delving too far here, the basic point is that government spending on procurement in somewhere like the United States, where most production is domestic, can have a supportive effect on the economy. Nowhere near the same as investing in, say, productive infrastructure. Bridges, trains, power generation, things like that. Things that enable larger economic activity. But you don't primarily go into the defence business to stimulate the economy. You go into the defence business to have a military. But when you're producing domestically, there are countervailing economic benefits that help take the edge off the cost. Academic research suggests for every dollar the United States spends on defence, it increases GDP by somewhere between 0.6 and $1.2. Now, when I look at equivalent research at developing countries, often you see a lower multiplier. That is, they get less value for money in terms of stimulating the economy out of every dollar they invest in defense spending. In part, I'd suggest that's because the United States has a high technology manufacturing sector supporting the defense sector. Spending your defense budget, getting a million private conscriptiviches to clean latrines, does not have the economic multiplier effect of, I don't know, investing in advanced R&D, which also has flow-on effects to the rest of the economy, or inventing new production and manufacturing techniques for aircraft, which again, also transfer over to the civilian economy and help your aviation sector become a world beater. 
If you're spending on high tech and you're spending at home, you're going to get a lot for your money as well as just a pretty airplane at the end of it. And when those are the sort of financial and economic benefits that may be at stake, there's a lot behind the decision of whether to make something domestically or purchase it in from abroad. If you've studied business or management, it should actually be a very familiar sort of decision. It's the classic make or buy decision. Another formulation might be in-house or outsource. Do you want to do something within your own four walls, in this case, the four walls of a nation, or are you willing to go outside to get external expertise and support? So when the military comes to you and says that there is a doctrinal requirement for X piece of equipment with Y specifications, you have a couple of options as to how to go about getting that for them, assuming that you want to actually go ahead and spend the money to procure that capability. Different countries have made very different decisions historically here. I've got arms import and export figures from 2016 to 21. These are the CIPRI trend indicator value numbers here. The blue bar is imports 16 to 21. The orange bar is exports over the same time period. And I don't want this to focus on the arms trade, but it's important to illustrate here for a moment. You look at countries like the United States. The United States has by far the largest defense budget on the planet. It also has the largest equipment procurement budget. And yet in terms of arms imports over the period of 16 to 21, it's sort of sitting in the same area as the United Kingdom and Japan, far behind countries with far smaller budgets like India, Saudi Arabia, even Egypt and Australia. At the same time, there is a tremendous outflow of weapons from the United States into the international market. It's actually even more interesting to look at the numbers for Russia, France and Germany, countries with far smaller defence budgets, very, very, very low levels of arm import and very high export levels. At the same time, there are countries like India with basically no arms exports until very, very recently and quite high levels of imports. Why might that be the case? Part of it comes down to a pretty simple, hard decision that you have to make. Unless you're a market leader, that is, unless you are the best country in the world at manufacturing a certain class of equipment, you're probably going to have to make some hard choices when you purchase it. Most people are familiar with the idea that you can have something good, you can have something quick, or you can have something cheap, but you can't have all three at the same time. When it comes to defence procurement, I've very roughly thrown up my own trade-off there. You can have something cheap, you can have something cutting edge, that is, the best out there for your needs, or you can have something built domestically. If you're a market leader, you get to pick all three. For example, if you're Germany and you're buying tank guns, congratulations, you win, you can have all three. If you're most nations, you get to pick two. And if you're a particularly unfortunate nation, say you're under serious sanctions, well, then you really only have to pick one. You're stuck with whatever you can produce in your own workshops. So that'll be domestic, but it's probably not going to be cheap and it's probably not going to be cutting edge. Now, there are other factors to consider here, like risk and intellectual property, but really we can weave them in with these headings. Keep these three headings in mind as we talk through some of the primary mechanisms you can use to procure hardware for your military. And the simplest solution most of the time is to buy it from overseas. You just go find a foreign system, pick it off the shelf, or you pay a foreign firm to design a specific customized system for you, manufacture it overseas, and ship it into your country. Now, there are lots of advantages here. Firstly, unless you're under sanctions or you have poor relationships, you're probably going to have access to some of the best technology in the world. And for most nations, it's far better than the technology they can produce domestically because you can just go buy from the market leaders. Timeline-wise, you can access other people's industry. You can probably get it faster. It's low risk, and you're going to have a lot of interoperability with other nations that operate the stuff. On the downside, while there are not really many economic benefits domestically, it impacts your trade balance, so your money is going overseas in exchange for goods, so wealth is flowing out of the economy, and you're building up a dependency on foreign powers. But overall, what you're looking here is, usually this means you're going to be able to get either something really cutting edge for a moderate price compared to what it would cost to build it domestically, or you could get something really, really cheap, or some combination of the two. What you're not going to get is those domestic economic benefits. If you do want to start realising some domestic economic benefits, sort of a baby's first step approach is to do kit assembly. So this is where an overseas manufacturer will produce a lot of the very difficult components or subsystems. They'll ship them to you and all that you will do in your country is final assembly. Plus maybe add some components that you're manufacturing domestically. This can help industry gain experience with systems. If you haven't built tanks before, then convincing someone else to give you like the parts kit for a tanks or a fighter and train your people on how to assemble them, well, that can be a good start for industry. Plus, you're doing some of the industrial work in your country, so you get some tax revenues back, you generate some jobs, etc. The issue is you start to have to make concessions 
on the cost side in particular, and sometimes also on the technology side. On the cost side, no one's going to willingly train up a competitor on how to assemble their stuff. They'd rather assemble them in their existing factories, plus you're having to establish whole new factories that don't exist yet and pay the startup cost for them. Technology transfer fees are the default here. You're paying someone to hand over their knowledge, their information to train you up, so you have what you need in order to start doing the assembly on your side. Countries like India and China have historically often combined this technique with foreign purchases to ease themselves into a new system. So they might buy some entire examples of a new Russian tank from overseas. Then they might do part kit assembly domestically and steadily move towards the next option, which is to start doing licensed production at home. So if you think your industry can handle it, you might go for a licensed local production solution. So this is where you pay for the intellectual property and the permission to take someone else's design and manufacture most of its components and the final vehicle itself in your territory. You're not assembling kits from Ural Vagonzavod anymore. You're building as much of it as possible domestically and assembling what is essentially a T90S tank, but you're doing it in India. Now, this arrangement can take a couple of forms. You might just license it and get a domestic company to manufacture your copies. Alternatively, if you have a lot of market power, you might be able to convince the company in question to set up a local subsidiary in your country and do all the manufacturing work there. This arrangement captures most of those domestic economic benefits we talked about earlier. You're doing most of the manufacturing work and you're creating most of the jobs in your country and you're getting access to some reasonably cutting edge technology. The problem here comes on the expense side of the equation because now you're paying licensing fees that go overseas that leak out of your economy. You may actually also find restrictions on getting the most cutting edge technology this way. In a lot of cases, countries can be pretty guarded of their top tier technologies. They don't want to export them and they don't want to teach other people how to build them. So while America might be very, very happy to sell you F-35, America is not going to let someone else license the production of F-35 in your country. Russia and China have not put their absolute top tier next generation systems up for export offer historically. And there are certain technology classes that are never even made available for foreign sale in the first place. Think F-22, think B-2. So you're starting to capture some domestic benefit here, but the cost is going up quickly. And while you can access some pretty top tier technologies, you probably can't access as many as you could if you were just doing a foreign purchase. So frustrated that the Americans won't sell you F-22 or B-2, you've gone to the Chinese and they won't sell you J-20 either. So you put on your best Thanos voice and you say, fine, I'll do it myself. This is the domestic production option where you research, develop and produce something entirely domestically. It sounds like a really good idea. You capture all those economic benefits. You maximize your security through self-reliance. But there are a lot of hard choices and costs involved. As much as I would pay good money to see the Poles design and field their own indigenous fifth generation strike aircraft, there are some serious reasons that hold certain countries back from doing this. Indigenization seems like the natural automatic option, but it's also kind of hard. And that's what I want to look at now, because that's a critical element to this. Why can't countries just manufacture their own defense equipment in order to capture those sweet, sweet secondary economic benefits? After all, I'm not sure a politician ever lost an election promising to create more high paying jobs while also becoming less dependent on insert major superpower ally here. Unfortunately for everyone who thinks it would be hilarious if Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia could get together and field the world's first sixth generation fighter to defend their territory, there are challenges in terms of complexity and barriers to entry, there are scale challenges, there are all sorts of risks, and there's the problem of competitive advantage for those who are already entrenched in the field. I want to unpack each of these in turn because it explains a little bit of why only certain countries are dominant in the market and why it's so expensive to try and break in. And the first barrier is just that some systems are so complex, so difficult to research, to develop, to design and manufacture that very few countries actually have the capacity to do it. It's not like the early 20th century. It's not like the First World War where a couple of mad inventors could buy an aircraft engine, hack something together literally in their garage, and then try and sell the resulting aircraft to the war department. Modern aircraft like F-35 just can't be sketched up in your garage. They're masterpieces of computer-assisted design dependent on thousands of interrelated technologies, and they're not just designed, they're coded. 
And as much as I would love the tradition that built such systems as the Owen gun find its way into the modern world, very few mad inventors are going to be able to also design the software for a fly-by-wire system or manage weapons integration requirements. So here there's a really big difference between the sort of systems you're talking about. A lot of countries out there, if they want to, are probably going to be able to domestically manufacture their own assault rifle. Most countries can throw together the manufacturing capability to build firearms. They may not be the cheapest on the market, they may not be the best on the market, but just about everyone can probably build a rifle if they want to. But if you want to produce top-end, high-technology goods, well then you need to be ready to invest or be one of the established market leaders. You can't just produce the most advanced semiconductors overnight. You can't just design a fifth or even sixth generation aircraft overnight. You can't just rig up stealth technology in your backyard. Well, I guess you can. You could build a plane out of wood. But you understand what I'm talking about. Modern stealth technology. And rifles is a good example here, or rocket launchers, compared to something like fighter engines. There are a lot of countries out there that understand the concept of propellant, behind round, put it in tube, go bang, infantry assault weapon, ready to go. That's a weapon system where, yeah, if you're dedicated, you probably can bash together a submachine gun in your garage. Although, depending on the laws in your jurisdiction, I would strongly recommend against it. But when you talk about aircraft engines, there's really only a few major firms that have the intellectual property, that have the experience and the workforce and the facilities to do it, and they dominate the market. Two of them are American, General Electric and Pratt & Whitney. They manufacture just about everything that makes the American Air Force and aircraft of the American Navy fly. Then you've got Rolls-Royce engines. The lineage leads to places like the Eurofighter. You've got Safran in France who manufacture the engine for the Rafale and also have a 50-50 joint venture with General Electric that is major in the civil aviation market. And then there are other countries that can manufacture engines at scale. It's basically limited to Russia and very, very recently, China. And China invested a fortune and decades in trying to catch up with where the Soviet Union was at the time of its collapse. It can take decades to develop an engine. Manufacturing them is exceptionally difficult. So usually most countries, even if they are desperate to indigenize production, fall back on either licensed copies of existing engines or just giving up and importing the engines from an established manufacturer. And I can kind of illustrate this point by just looking at four indigenous fighter programs here for a moment. That is, fighter programs that are designed to give a nation the ability to produce its own combat aircraft to defend its own sovereignty and national interests. You have the F-2, the Viper Zero, which is a modified, scaled-up F-16 that's built in Japan. But the power plant is a General Electric F-110. The KF-21 Boromay, very impressive achievement of Korean industry that has recently been unveiled. But again, the power plant there is two General Electric engines, a, a joint development with General Electric that's going to be manufactured in Korea, to be sure. But the base is a General Electric engine, and GE is involved. Then you have India's effort, the Tejas. India has been trying to develop its own domestic engine for fighters since the 80s. And they're still not quite at the point where they've got one that they have designed domestically, that they can manufacture domestically to put in their aircraft. So it's powered by a General Electric F404. The Mark II is going to be powered by another General Electric motor until Indian industry is able to furnish a domestic engine. And then you have the Saab Gripen. The Gripen is a representative of Sweden's desire to continue to be defense independent, to defend its neutrality. Well, until recently, its neutrality. And it on paper is powered by something called the Volvo Fliegmotor RM12. And you're like, haha, finally something that isn't a general electric engine. Except it's a licensed copy of, well, a licensed modified copy of the General Electric F404. You can see my point. And I could have brought in a host of examples that go way beyond this as well. When Israel tried to develop the Lavi in order to be independent of the United States, that was still going to be powered by an American engine, the same engine as the F-16. The cost and the complexity and the barriers to entry mean that even if you make the decision as a government to go into the domestic fighter aircraft manufacturing business, if you want to be technologically competitive and you want to build your own engine, that's going to be a matter of decades of investment and billions of dollars. So a lot of the time, it's just easier to call up General Electric or Pratt & Whitney or Rolls-Royce or the French and get your engines that way. And the next challenge is simply scale. Most nations need fighters or they need tanks, but they don't need particularly many of them. And from a cost perspective, that's a real problem. 
Longer and larger production runs have a lot of advantages. They let you spread the research and development costs over more aircraft. If it costs a fortune to develop an aircraft, you need to spread that load over the aircraft that you eventually sell, which means if you produce a thousand F-35s, the exorbitant research budget can be spread out over time and the unit cost can come down. If you only produce a hundred or 20, well, then you end up with the B-2 Spirit that ended up costing two billion US dollars per plane because they only built 20 of them. And there's also a limit to how efficient your manufacturing can be and how advanced sort of mass manufacturing techniques can use if you're only going to produce small numbers of things. Japan is a good example here. Japan is a technologically advanced nation. It is a major economy and it has industrial manufacturing capabilities. It's got the workforce, it has the technology, it has facilities in order to manufacture pretty high-tech stuff. The problem is Japan has rules against exporting military hardware and the Japanese self-defense forces don't really need that many aircraft or that many tanks, but Japan is committed to domestic production of both. And so you end up with indigenous aircraft like the F-2, which is based originally on the F-16, is produced domestically in Japan, but because of the R&D costs and the short production run, it's markedly more expensive than the F-16. Japanese tanks face a similar problem, uh, the Type 90 and the more modern ones as well. That would be the Type 10 that I have in the bottom right-hand corner there, are advanced machines, but they're horrifically expensive, at least for their weight class and capabilities compared to something like Abrams or Leopard 2. And a lot of that comes down to the fact that heavy industry in Japan is good, but it's not capable of making a production run of one to 300 vehicles cost efficient. Now, again, this is another one of those cases where different systems are going to have different break-even points, like a different number of the thing that you have to manufacture in order for the scale advantages to come in and for you to start having a price advantage over your foreign producers. But if you're only going to produce a small number of aircraft or a small number of armoured vehicles, then setting up domestic production might be more trouble than it's worth, particularly for high-tech things like aircraft. I would love to see Croatia manufacturing advanced fighter aircraft, but again, unless they're going to get very, very significant numbers of export orders, the scale probably just doesn't work. And then there's the problem of risk. Development isn't a risk-free process. It's not like a video game where you click research a technology and a certain number of turns later, it pops out predictably and you can produce a unit and you know how it's going to perform right out of the box. History is full of design programs that are delayed, that suffer cost overruns, or they just get to the end, they produce the design, and it's just not very good. At some point, military necessity suggests you can't wait forever. If your requirement was for an aircraft, you can't wait 30 years for the designers to get it right, and the government presumably doesn't have an infinite R&D budget. Economics says there's a limit to how much money you can pour into a particular R&D effort. So if your nation has a small economy, then there's a lot of dangers in going all in on a development project. Something like the Lavi program for Israel or the Gripen for Sweden, those are serious investments of national wealth, effort, and workforce. And if those products reach the end of their development cycle and turn out to be crap, well, then that's an enormous detriment to that country. I said before that India has been working for decades on getting an engine to put into its domestic fighter aircraft. That engine should already have been in service many, many years ago. It is over budget and it's over time. That's not because India is incompetent, it's because development of new fighter aircraft engines is difficult, it's expensive, and delays and extensions are to be expected. So the point here is, if you're buying military assets to do something like, I don't know, defend your country, which is a relatively high priority goal, and you kind of want resources available to do it, then you might be a lot safer bringing in a foreign technology that you know works, rather than risking everything on a development program. If you're World War II Germany, and Porsche comes to you and says he has a great plan for a gasoline electric drive tank that is totally going to win the war, that's a bad idea. Because just because he says it'll cost X million marks and be ready in a year, doesn't mean that you won't get to the point where in two years, when it's ready, the end result just catches on fire. That's kind of how R&D goes in reality, a lot of the time. And the final problem is one you're going to run into when you inevitably try to sell your hardware, unless you're someone like Japan. Because for most nations, the obvious way to make military production profitable is to sell your product abroad. It means you get more scale in your production so you can bring costs down, you can spread the risk potentially over foreign buyers, 
and you can get a situation where all those domestic economic benefits I talked about, jobs and tax revenues and the spurring of technological growth, all of those things happen. It's just the original dollar doesn't come from your government. It comes from a foreign buyer. It's great for the trade balance. It's a superb idea all round. And so many pitches for the development of new weapons begin with a promise that there will be massive export orders if only we can get this thing into production, and all we need is some money from the government in order to get that online. It's happened so many times in history. When you come to export things, you're suddenly in a very hostile environment. At home, in the domestic environment, that's one thing. The government might decide to buy your product even if it's not very good, even if it's not the cheapest thing on the market, because as I said, all of those domestic economic benefits plus sovereignty and control over the defense industry, there's lots of reasons that government might settle for second best as long as it's made at home. Is your country's version of the T-72 upgrade package better than the best Western MBTs on the market? Nope. Is it cheaper than the best imported tanks from places like Russia or China? Potentially also no, but it's built in your country and damn it, you're going to use it. But no one else is likely to be particularly sentimental about buying your hardware. If another country has made the decision to buy in hardware from overseas, it's going to want the best it can get for the cheapest possible price. And most of the time that means something that a market leader is putting out. Those M84s in Croatia may look great with a Croatian flag on top, but they're going to really struggle to win export orders when they're competing against tanks from China, tanks from Russia, and tanks from the various Western powers. The Leopard 2 and the M1s, they're going to outperform them in tests, and when it comes to people who want Soviet-derived technology, well, again, the Russians are still working with that sort of stuff, and they can do it at scale and somewhat cheaper, at least until present circumstances complicated the Russian export market. I mean, seriously, I'm going to have to look at how the global arms trade has changed dramatically as a result of the Ukraine war. Like, it means a lot. There are some far-reaching implications there, which I will look at another time. But the point stands. Building a product that is good enough for your own government to buy is one thing, but overcoming the competitive advantage of entrenched powers, that is a tall order. You want to build your own version of F-35? You want to build your own fifth-generation stealth fighter and strike aircraft? You can go for it. There are a number of nations out there that will eventually achieve that goal. But the moment they start trying to sell it abroad, they're competing with F-35. And when it comes to the international trade, Uncle Sam's a pretty powerful opponent. I thought one way to bring together the concepts that we've discussed in this video might be to look at one of the entrenched market players and the advantage that they enjoy, why they enjoy those advantages, and I thought the US would be a good example, mostly because I want to look at China and Russia again in different contexts, and I also want to do a video on France and Europe at some point, so I'll be able to cover some of the major European manufacturers at that point. The United States' biggest advantage in this space in terms of getting equipment manufactured domestically is that they begin by being the dominant consumer. If you are a company who is in the business of selling military hardware, it's the American contracts that you really, really want to win. Indeed, for some contracts, America is at the moment the only realistic market that you can target. If, for example, you sell, I don't know, stealth bombers, you really only have three potential clients out there. The Chinese, the Russians, and the Americans. The Chinese and Russians are very attached to their own projects, which means if you're going to make any money, you're going to sell to Uncle Sam. Whatever you make, the chances are the Americans are the largest customer out there. And what that translates to is buying power. Massive buying bargaining power. In some ways, it kind of resembles, say, single-payer healthcare systems for drugs around the world. Because there's only one purchaser of those drugs or those services, the government, the government is able to keep those prices way down because basically suppliers can either choose to have no profit in a market or they can take the price that they're offered. In the United States, Congress usually isn't too stingy on price so much as they're stingy on where you make something. If you're Ryan Mattel and you invent a 120mm gun the US wants to put on the Abrams, that's fantastic. But you're going to license that production and you're going to manufacture it in the United States and you're going to transfer a lot of technology around it. New infantry weapon? Yeah, you're going to make that in the United States. In fact, you're going to create a US subsidiary and you're going to pay taxes in the US. You're going to manufacture that in the US. Okay? Major air combat system like the F-35. Not only are you going to manufacture that in the United States, you're going to spread that production along 40 plus states and Puerto Rico. The only production you're going to do overseas is because some of our partners paid into the project and you're going to make sure that those jobs and benefits and that technology advantage are spread across as many necessary constituencies as possible. 
And this pattern repeats over and over again. The F2 program in Japan, the Japanese complained the United States exploited its position to make sure that where Japan was developing technologies for the project, some of those flowed right back to the United States in exchange for the support that US companies were providing. And because the United States then puts restrictions on certain technology exports, well, that means companies have a choice. They can operate in the United States and access its markets and not engage with their technology outside the US, or they can go for broke and try and make a profit outside the US market. Most make the decision to target the US market and play by Uncle Sam's rules. The results is a lot of technical and capital concentration within the United States itself. The United States also has the ability to bring costs down, particularly when we're talking about aerospace products and things like that. The US isn't really dominant in, say, the armored vehicle market, but in the aerospace industry and the military aerospace industry, they're one of the lower cost providers out there if you discount places like Russia and China. And I'm sure to many Americans this might seem strange to hear. After all, America isn't really a low cost environment. It has a very high wage. Cost of labor tends to be high. There are environmental protection regulations that don't exist in some countries. There are rules that you have to follow. There are state taxes to be paid. The United States is not the cheapest place in the world to manufacture stuff generally. It's why a lot of American manufacturing has steadily been lost overseas for several decades to lower cost environments where you can pay people a lot less. And places where inputs like electricity are also cheaper. But there are a couple of factors that come together to give America an advantage when it comes to the costs involved in producing military hardware, particularly when we're talking about aircraft. Scale, learning curves, risk mitigation, accumulated capital, policy incentives, all of these come together to give the US a little bit of a competitive advantage when it comes to these sort of products. And we've already talked about one of the biggest ones, which is scale. America buys an awful lot of aircraft which means that manufacturers of aircraft in America can adopt mass production techniques in order to dilute R&D costs and to steadily bring costs down. When the first F-35s left the production line, the things cost about $200 million. As of 2020, the goal is to bring that number down to about $80 million for the latest block of F-35 purchases. In some places, aircraft are almost artisanally crafted. You can't employ mass production techniques and cost savings that come from buying in bulk and producing en masse. But Lockheed Martin is talking about producing something like 160 aircraft per year. That's almost one every two days. And at that point, you start looking at the situation where F-35, which is a fifth generation aircraft with stealth capabilities, a fully networked system, it's leading into another block of upgrades that will give it even further capabilities, and it's looking at a unit cost that is below that of many fourth generation systems that are out there. And part of that is just the fact that Lockheed Martin is being required to build a lot of the things. There's no American gene, or at least I've never seen any evidence that there's any genetic advantage for Americans that makes them inherently better at building aircraft. But they're going to have an advantage when they're building 150 F-35s a year. That might be the entire production run for something like the Gripen E. So to an extent, this help explains the fact that America can afford to develop technologies first to lead the way because the number of units that they produce and procure means that they can employ the sort of techniques and scale that spread those costs out over multiple aircraft and keep costs controllable, whereas other nations that are procuring fewer aircraft just simply couldn't do it. And this phenomenon helps explain why so many times when a military cuts back its procurement order in terms of number of aircraft, they don't make as many savings as you'd think because the unit costs the remaining ones go up. The cost efficiency strength of the military industrial complex in the United States owes a lot to the fact that it operates on just an entirely different scale to most other powers. The next point is that it's not just that American production lines run fast, they run long. Those who have studied management and economics before would be familiar with the concept of learning curves. That is, the longer you run a process, the longer you run a production line, the lower costs tend to become. People become better at their jobs because they develop better ways of doing the job. Small refinements are constantly made, and that helps explain why the production cost of something like a Sherman during World War II reduced steadily year by year. If you're only servicing a small order, what you'll see in many countries is they run the production line for a short period of time, they produce all of the vehicles necessary, and they shut the production line down, and they go into, like, sustainment and rebuilds only. America has been running some of its production lines continuously for a very, very, very long time. 
F-15, F-16, those are creatures of the late Cold War, but there's been a chain of continuous improvement and understanding that's helped improve those lines. Though F-16 did suspend production for a short period of time while they relocated the manufacturing centre. Abrams, likewise. Abrams has been in production for decades. You will have famously heard the stories about the times where Congress has insisted on buying tanks that the army doesn't want to purchase. In part, it's yes, it's because Congress obviously has an interest in jobs in their constituencies. But also it's just because once you shut down production, it's hard to turn it back on again, and you lose a lot of the accumulated experience, skills, and learning curve that you've got up to that point. America has become pretty damn good at building the Abrams. So continuing to produce it even when the army doesn't necessarily want more, well, that ironically helps keep the unit cost down, so it's still around when, say, Poland comes around and decides they want to buy every Abrams except V3 that you can produce. Add to that the fact that US manufacturers generally face less risk if they have a US contract. What do I mean by that? Well, let's just say you're designing a product for another country and you know that your primary method of surviving is going to be getting an export contract on that thing. To keep production of Rafale going or to keep production of Gripen going, Sweden and Finland need to keep selling their aircraft. Now that's a risk because they might know they have a really good product, but you never really know if another country is going to buy your product. Maybe they're going to not buy any aircraft. Maybe another country is going to bribe them. And as a result, they're going to end up buying some piece of crap instead because someone got a payoff. You just don't know. So you have to be careful with your cost baits. You have to be careful with your investments. You have to be careful not to take on too much debt, build up too much inventory, because there's a risk you might go bust if you over leverage and you over commit. US contracts tend to be big enough, even if they never really get to export a single plane. America buys enough of the F-15, enough of the F-16, and they bought enough of the F-18 that McDonnell Douglas or Boeing or Lockheed Martin are not going to go bust on a project just because everyone around there decides that suddenly they won't buy anything that doesn't have canards, for example. Lockheed Martin knows that even if tomorrow, if everyone out there decides to not buy another F-35, they're safe, they're okay. What this means is that US companies, knowing they are going to have their US contract, can make certain assumptions around how they invest in production, around how they research, around how they invest their money, around how much debt they take on, on how big a production run they commit to. And all of that allowed them to build better products and to invest more heavily in bringing the cost down quicker, all else being equal. I stress there, all of these examples are all else being equal scenarios. And knowing the Pentagon, usually the stress is on best over cheapest. And what all those advantages taken together mean is that over time, the American advantage in technology, in human and physical capital, it just steadily accumulates. Talent capital is drawn to the US market. If you are someone who wants to work in designing fighters or wants to build engines or wants to work at a major manufacturer in the aerospace sector, you might look at your prospects of getting production of an indigenous program started and decide, nah. I'm attracted by the salary, I'm going to go to the United States. If I want to invest in that industry, am I going to put all my money into a startup or am I going to put my money into the United States? America draws this talent and draws this capital in, attracted by the scale of its military industrial complex, and as a result, it becomes more and more difficult to duplicate that expertise and scale elsewhere. And each super profitable, advantageous, relatively risk-free contract that a manufacturer wins with the US DOD gives that company more economic resources and security and a better trained and more capable workforce and a better technology base, which they can use to win the next contract and to snowball until they experience greater and greater advantages. There's also a technology point here. The US tends to accumulate, all else being equal, a technological advantage. It tends to stay ahead of the curve. Why? Because it has the funds and the circumstances that push companies and also get funded by the DoD itself through things like DARPA and research and development incentives and the taxation system. There's a lot of factors that come together to try and encourage US firms to push the boundaries of technology. Then Uncle Sam limits their right to export that technology, which means the US maintains an advantage. Which means if you are a country and you have a military requirement that requires some of that technology in a product, well, suddenly you're restricted. If you want to buy a fifth generation fighter, at the moment, off the shelf, realistically, your option is F-35. And America's not going to let anyone else take that technological advantage away. And America's approach, essentially, is that by the time other people catch up, America has developed the next generational leap and maintains the dominant lead in terms of technology 
So faced with the prospect of either trying to catch up and develop their own equivalent to F-35 and then somehow find a way to make it cost 80 million per plane eventually, most countries instead give up and they buy F-35 or they buy an American system in a lot of cases. And that leads to the sort of the final American advantage, which is not just that those purchases help America bring its production costs down by giving the American manufacturers more scale or keeping the production lines open longer, although both of those are true. Other nations are essentially subsidizing the American military industrial complex and its accumulation of capital. No, the final point of advantage is this. Because everyone else is buying American weapons, there's a pretty good reason for you to do it too. Major technological platforms in the military, they're kind of like cars. You want to have one that is common and popular. If you own a Toyota Corolla and you roll up at any auto shop just about anywhere in Europe or the United States, they're probably going to know how to fix it and they're probably going to have spare parts. You roll up in the latest Ferrari, well, I hope you're ready to wait for the shipping on those parts. A lot of American systems, leaving aside the performance differential, are kind of like that. F-16 is a good example. The F-16 is a lightweight, relatively affordable fighter aircraft and the best export success of the modern US aviation sector in the military sphere. A lot of countries have bought F-16. I've got a list of operators past and current from the website there on the right. So if you're looking to buy F-16 as a smaller nation, there's a lot of advantages to buying a system that other people have invested in. There will almost certainly be upgrade packages. If you design your own aircraft, indigenous, who's going to pay for designing the next software update? the next upgrade package, the next weapon integration. Every single time there needs to be an upgrade, you are the one that is going to invest in and do that. If you buy from a country which has relatively limited export success, they may at any point decide to you know, stop development, to not produce new versions of the aircraft. Well, with F-16, you're probably safe. There are enough buyers that there are people out there who will finance continuous upgrade packages. The line is probably going to be there. America is probably going to keep manufacturing spare parts for a long time to come, as are the various places that are now involved in the F-16 supply chain. If you were the only customer for an aircraft, manufacturer might close the line on you because it's not economical to keep a spares line open. But if thousands of people are flying F-16, well then they're going to keep producing spares for decades to come. If you decide you want to get rid of your aircraft, just like having a common car, there's fantastic resale value. Everyone is either going to want your aircraft or they're going to want to scrap them for parts in order to keep their own fleets flying. And if any of these people happen to be your friends, if you have friends, then you're more likely to be interoperable with them. Maybe you can share parts, your pilots understand each other, you're good at operating together. F-16s are going to be better at talking to F-16s than they are talking with MiG-29s. So yes, you're now dependent on the USA. You're handing over funds and you're allowing them to realize the economic benefits. But at the same time, you're sort of free riding. You don't have to do the development on upgrades. You don't have to do the research. And you're sort of riding on the production scale that all these other purchases and the USAF are allowing them to operate. This doesn't hold true for all defense products. In fact, it's most visible when you're talking about the really high-end stuff. But there are reasons that a lot of nations look at this situation even when they themselves can probably produce something equivalent to the F-16, the same way Japan did, and decide that it is more cost-effective or it is a less risky, a better decision to just purchase F-16, to become a part of that wider American arms ecosystem. So to bring this all together, I thought I'd tell the tale of two aircraft, the Gripen and the F-35. The Gripen is the crowning glory of the Swedish aerospace industry. It is a fourth generation aircraft that was designed on a tight budget and it features a whole bunch of really intelligent design elements that come together to try and keep the cost per unit and the cost per flying hour down as low as possible. This is an aircraft that was designed to operate from rough fields and to be economically viable. It was a perfect aircraft essentially for Sweden and they tried to push it into a number of export markets. People love to trash the Gripen. I'm not one of those people. It's a really good fourth generation aircraft. And the fact that it was able to compete in so many competitions and perform relatively well attests to that. The F-35, by contrast, where to start? The F-35 is a fifth generation aircraft, not a fourth or a 4.5 gen. It features numerous technological innovations. So it was supported by a crushingly expensive research and development budget. It had delays and cost overruns all through its development. It was slow to enter production. The thing has had to be redesigned and patched to reach its current state. And when you look at where the design priorities are, they mostly rest on performance characteristics first with cost being a distant second. 
This is a much more capable, much blingier aircraft than the Saab Gripen. And yet, we are starting to reach the point where new build F-35s are selling for per unit costs that are starting to get pretty close to what the latest versions of the Gripen will cost. And I think that says a lot. The lean, clean fighter from the economically conscious program that Saab runs in Sweden is starting to enter the same sort of cost profile, at least in initial acquisition cost, as the cutting edge system that has constantly been attacked for its cost overruns and the immense amount of resources that had to be sunk into its production. And while the why of that situation is admittedly very complex, a lot of it probably comes back to the fact that the US military industrial complex and Uncle Sam have decided to build an awful lot of F-35s. And because they've decided to build a lot of F-35s, the military industrial complex goes burr, Lockheed Martin spreads those R&D costs out, brings the unit costs down, ramps up rate production, the learning curves kick in, and all of a sudden this American ecosystem, this F-35 ecosystem, starts to be able to deliver cost-effective airplanes that also happen to be among or potentially the best in the world. It's the blingiest product out there, and it's also cost-competitive. That's the American competitive advantage in a nutshell. Now, some of you may immediately go to ask, well, if America has all of those advantages, how come it only commands about 39% of the arms export market? How come Russia was previously, despite having a fraction of the GDP and a fraction of the military budget to support its industry, able to hold about 18-19% of global arms exports? How come France is up there with 10.7% despite having a military budget a fraction of the scale of the Americans? Well, that's a really interesting question, and one that I'll look at another time if this video goes well enough. In any case, in conclusion, defense budgets are very hard to compare like with like. That's where we started here. Just because one country spends 200 billion and another country spends 100 billion, that doesn't necessarily tell you a huge amount about the cost each nation happens to incur. It's also very hard to price individual items within those budgets. Contracts for systems are very rarely like with like, so be very careful when you're on Quora boards and people are claiming that their product of their country is cheaper. One of the biggest differentiators of how much procurement of technology and equipment actually costs is where that equipment comes from. Is it produced domestically or is it produced abroad or something in between? Because domestic production usually allows you to harness a whole bunch of ancillary economic benefits and to make some financial benefits back directly through things like taxation. But there are major barriers for new market entrants which make establishing your own military industrial complex in some technology areas not the easiest thing to do. And there are significant advantages that incumbents like the United States, like Russia, like France and Germany enjoy. And if you are trying to work out how much your government actually spends on defense, or rather how much that defense spending really costs in a wider economic sense, one safe place to start is by asking where that money is being spent. All right, channel update to close out. The first thing to say is that I originally wasn't gonna do this particular video for some time. I was gonna keep pushing with the Ukraine content, but when I put up a vote for patrons, they said that they wanted to see more of the defense economic stuff, and this was actually the most voted for topic of the list that I put out. So I thank them for making topics like this possible. It really does mean that I can afford to take a risk on something that may or may not get the same sort of hits that my more Ukraine-focused content does. The next point to say is that as of time of recording, I am really close to hitting this 200,000 subscriber mark. That is absolutely nuts for someone who does slideshows on geopolitical developments and defense economics. I'm absolutely grateful that people have come forward, that they engage with the content, they listen to it, and they engage in such a productive and supportive way in the comments and through other vectors as well. I genuinely appreciate it. I'm now back from traveling, at least for a little bit, so give me a brief uh, few days to catch my breath, and then I'm gonna look more at the administrative side of the channel again. The first on the list is things like subtitles. They've been on the back burner for months. There are people who I need to respond to uh, email offers of help for. Those responses are coming, and I'm gonna try and get these video subtitles as soon as possible as a first step, so watch this space. Next week, in line with the Patreon topic vote, I think we're going back to Ukraine, so stay tuned. But there should be more defense economics topics coming up in the future. I've teased some of them before. Though how I prioritize and order things, well, some of that will owe to how this video happens to perform. However it does, I want to say thank you again for listening. Thank you again for engaging. And I will see you all again soon.